So today's case is ground zero for me. When I was nine years old, a serial killer struck my hometown that would eventually lead three victims in its wake, two females and a male. The first victim, a convenience store clerk, had he struck two weeks earlier, would have been my aunt who was his first victim. Now I had an encounter with this man after he was arrested and was being held ready for trial. And I wrote that encounter down and I sent it to a popular narrator here in YouTube. A man by the name of Unit 522 who also goes by the name Uncle Unit. And I got excited when I found out he was going to narrate the story. And he did a wonderful, outstanding, fantastic job of narrating the story. And that video has now gone on to garner over 100,000 views. So about a week or two before I left to go to Idaho to film this series, I reached out to 522 to see if he would allow me to use portions of his narrations of my story to tell this story. And when he told me I could, that was it. I was extremely excited. So today, come join me and my guest narrator, Unit 522, as we tell the story of the Southeastern Idaho serial killer. In this case, it's personal. There should be no odd against killing people. This morning, the state put to death Paul Ezra Rhodes. Seven years ago today, a Pocatello woman was murdered, and that case remains unsolved. Our first victim is Olivia Cassie, his daughter. She's going to be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? Gathered tonight in Pocatello to show support for the family of 11-year-old Jerry Underwood. The events I'm about to describe are completely true and took place in early 1987. A little backstory. I grew up in a small town in the southeast corner of Idaho. My father was a medical officer for the local county jail. Most calls for police assistance came from one of the few bars in town where the natives and rednecks would have one too many and would often end up squaring off with each other. The rest of the time it was responding to noise complaints juvenile delinquents, and domestic disputes. My uncle, on my mother's side, who I will call Rich, lived nearby and recently became engaged to his longtime girlfriend, who I will refer to as Sharon. Sharon was an attractive tall blonde, and worked as a night shift clerk for a local convenience store called the Mini Barn. It was named that due to its appearance of resembling an old school farmer's barn. It sat in the northwest corner of the town, next to an old highway, once used as access to the nearby towns, before Interstate 15 was completed. Uncle Rich and Sharon would visit our home on a regular basis. I can't remember the exact day, but I do remember it was either late January or early February, when Rich and Sharon arrived a bit later than they normally would. Usually they would arrive in the late morning or early afternoon, However, this time they arrived after the sun had set and were braving a pretty serious snowstorm. My parents were shocked by the visit and invited them in. So the night that my aunt and uncle showed up at the house there on Pearl Drive, my childhood home, they came in and they went into the kitchen and they started talking. They were trying to talk under their in a lowered tone, trying to make it so that nobody could hear what they were saying. It didn't really work that great, because we all heard. Now, most of us really weren't paying attention, but once we started hearing the conversation, we kind of started paying a little bit more attention, because my aunt basically was telling my dad 
that there was a guy that was coming into the store she worked at, the mini barn. Tall, stocky, very big. She said, used overweight. Long hair. Described him as just this monster. And it was at this point that my dad told my aunt that she really seriously needed to consider purchasing a firearm and applying for a concealed weapons license through the Bingham County Sheriff's Office. Now, Sharon was soft-spoken and had a very shy personality. So I knew my father's recommendation of carrying a firearm would go over like a fart in church. About three weeks after that conversation occurred, we were at a family get-together where Uncle Rich and Sharon were in attendance. I did hear something about a customer witnessing someone matching the man's description peering through a window at Sharon. When confronted, the large man jumped into his truck which was parked behind the store and sped off down the old highway. Sharon announced that she had left her job and that she and Uncle Rich were moving back to Utah to prep for their upcoming wedding. The next time we would see Sharon and Rich would be at their wedding four months later. What took place over that time would put all southeastern Idaho in a state of constant fear. About a week after Sharon quit the mini barn, on February 28th, just a little after midnight, some friends of the new night shift clerk walked into the store to check on her and to buy a few things. As they approached the store, they saw a pickup truck speeding out of the parking lot. While they couldn't see the face of the driver, they were able to make out that he had long hair. When they entered the store, the clerk was nowhere to be found. Her purse was behind the counter along with her keys and her car was still in the parking lot. Police were contacted and a search began immediately. All right, so what you see in front of you right there, that is the site of the old mini barn. The doors would have been about right where we're standing. Right about here where this SUV and, and everything is at is where the gas pumps were at. This is where our aunt actually worked and could have potentially been a victim. Where uh, she reported being uh, harassed by somebody matching Rhodes' description. Now, we lost touch with that side of the family after my uh, mom and dad's divorce. We never asked her, and we probably never will if we ever even see her again. But, uh, yeah, this is it right here. This is uh, was the site of the uh, Red Mini Barn. We just called it the Mini Barn. Um, which, after that situation happened, you know, with kids being the kids, it later got nicknamed the Murder Barn. It was kind of a sick joke, I don't think. We really grasped the entire situation as kids, yeah, we, but. Well, Stacy Baldwin just lives right now. Her parents just live right now. Yeah. At around 7 a.m., seven hours after she went missing, a motorist who was driving past some old dumpsters on a back road found Susie's body. She had been shot multiple times and was left for dead. So, this is the road pa Rose Pond area. Here's the archery range. None of this was here. This was all overgrown caves and stuff. That fence was not up. This was all gravel. Every bit of this was all gravel. That building did not exist. That building did not exist. This was all trees and all forests and everything. And it dead end right here. And the only way you could get in there was to walk in. And then the road is right there that you could no longer. See how they've got it blocked off. You now have to go this way. But this wasn't paved. This was all gravel. And this is this stuff. is the way that I remember coming in. That right was here. the way that you used yeah. to have to go in. They moved it over here when they paved all this. This used to be all the gravel. The dumpsters <coughs> sat. There were two of them, and they weren't faced that way. They sat like this right here, and she was in this dumpster when he found her. When they when the bishop, the local bishop, found her. Yep. But this was the exact. That was even there. If you find the vial footage, that was there. So this is where Stacy Baldwin. This is where she was found. It was right here. Uh, was it inside or outside she the dumpster? She was inside. Was she inside? Yeah. How did he find her? 
Uh, How did he find her? She was I inside. I don't remember. I was, was it blood? I, he saw blood or something? He, he, saw, he found something. Or she tried. Actually, no. She climbed out. She she was not dead. He, he threw, threw her. Yeah. yeah. He threw her in there. She climbed out, and he came <coughs> back. There was blood and stuff on the ground. An autopsy later revealed that the gunshots were not immediately fatal. Susie had laid there for hours in pain and felt her life slipping away. And here is Stacy Dawn Baldwin. I'm glad to see they gave her a headstone. 2009, and she was still just a uh, grave marker. This was the young lady that was kidnapped from the mini barn. Right there on Wooten Way, just a couple of hundred feet from our home, there on Pearl. It was the first uh, victim of Paul Ezra Rhodes. Dear Boss Tales would not exist if it was not for this situation right here. This is what started, <clears throat> well, most of my family's morbid fascination with uh, with uh, true crime and and all. And this is this was the ground zero for me. Really happy to see you. she's got a headstone now. Just under three weeks later, on March seventeenth. At a convenience store 28 miles south, a mail clerk was found in the walk-in cooler. He had been shot multiple times and was suffering from severe hypothermia, but he was still alive. Unfortunately, he would eventually succumb to his injuries. So welcome to Phillips 66 in Idaho Falls, Idaho. KG Superstore. Now all around this, back in 1986, this was Buck's travel stop. And it was, all this stuff you see around here looked exactly like what you see across the street. This is all new construction, but in 1986, this sat by itself with nothing around it. This is where Paula's Rhodes came in and uh, shot and killed his second victim, Nolan had. Now, Nolan was not supposed to be working that night. He actually was filling in for a uh, young female who had called in sick that night. So he took the shift. The report is Rhodes entered a little after midnight, or a little before midnight. Just before they closed, skulked around. Led Haddon at gunpoint after taking all the money from the register. Led him into the uh, cooler in the back of the store where he was shot. Now, Nolan didn't die right away. He actually lived throughout the night and was found by the assistant manager the next morning inside the cooler. The cold air inside the freezer actually kept him alive. He was rushed just down this road here to Eastern Idaho Regional Medical Center, which is known to the locals as Ermac. And uh, he succumbed to the injuries a few hours later. Here we have Nolan J. Haddon, victim number two of Paul Ezra Rhodes. He still denied it right up until the end. He admitted to Susan Micklebocker, but denied having anything to do with Stacey Baldwin or no one had in here. But this is his grave. No, he had no choice with Micklebocker because they had him on videotape when he made her take out money out of the bank. Here we have uh, Nolan's parents. His mom is still alive, but uh, his dad, Junior, passed away. Mm -hmm. Today is the second, so two years ago, just shy of 28 days, he passed away. It's just really sad. He was a cousin to my brother, 
Rob's best friend. It's just too bad. The killer would strike again only two days later in the same town, abducting a special education school teacher from the parking lot of a grocery store. She had been sexually assaulted and was shot nine times. This time, however, a nearby farmhand heard the shots and went to investigate. He saw a blue van, later identified as the victim's van, fleeing the scene, and behind the wheel was his cousin, who he identified as Paul Ezra Rhodes. Rhodes was a known meth addict and had been in trouble his whole life. He was known to law enforcement, who went to his mother's house to question him. Upon arriving at the house, his mother answered the door and stated that she had not seen Paul in several days and he had taken her car. He was later arrested at a casino in Wells, Nevada after crashing his mother's car and running from the scene. A trucker who witnessed the accident saw Rhodes drop something on the ground as he fled. Police arrived and found the item to be a 38 caliber revolver. Forensic testing later determined it to be the gun used to murder all three of the victims. This effectively tied Rhodes to the crimes and officially labeled him as a serial killer. Rhodes was also found to be in possession of personal items belonging to each of the victims. He confessed to detectives that he was behind the murders and was quickly expedited back to Idaho to stand trial. Upon arriving back in my town, he was booked into the county jail on the day of my 10th birthday. My dad was assigned to complete his medical intake. I asked my dad what Rhodes was like, fully expecting to hear of a snarling beast who was foaming at the mouth. What my dad told me shocked and confused me. My dad said that Rhodes was extremely polite and courteous. He described Rhodes as someone who said, please and thank you. And never had to be asked twice to do something. He even had the corrections officers and medical staff laughing at times. I couldn't believe that. I told myself my dad was lying to stop me from being scared. He was found guilty and sentenced to death for the murder of Susie the night clerk. He was then ready to be transferred to the next county over to stand trial for the murders that happened there. In the next county, Rhodes took a plea deal for the murder of the male convenience store clerk and received a life sentence. He pled not guilty for the school teacher's murder and went to trial. He was later found guilty and received a second death sentence. On May 18, 2011, Rhodes was led into the death chamber at Boise State Penitentiary at 8.30 a.m. and was strapped to a gurney. In his final statement, he admitted to and apologized for the death of the school teacher. However, he maintained his innocence of the other two murders. He then turned to the warden and executioner and told them that he forgave them for what they were about to do. He was then executed by a lethal injection and was pronounced dead at 9.15 a.m. Interest. It became yeah. more of a severe interest because this whole thing started in our old hometown. Yeah. Everything that that brought you to the point of making this video it all started with Paul Ezra Rhodes and the initial murder of Stacy Baldwin in 1987. And it, it, it piqued our curiosity at a very young age. And some people may say it, it became a morbid fantasy, I would say, or not a morbid fantasy, but a morbid uh, hobby. It, yeah. But I would look at it more as, a, uh, it's, it's, I find it interesting and fascinating. The, the way that these people work, the, the mindset that, that they get in that, that would make them want to do these things. Because, I mean, it's not like they just shot somebody and then left them to steal their money or something. The things that he did to these victims was, was far from what you would call pleasant in any way, shape, or form. And it, and it, it piqued our interest at a very young age. Well, and it's exactly, and it's it's more about remembering the victim as well. You exactly. Know, these, well, we knew her. Yeah, we knew Stacy. We, you know, your best friend, uh, JR, his, you know, Nolan was his cousin. Yeah. And 
Stacy's mom worked with Stacy's mom. Mom, fact, mom was the one who took the phone call from Verna when they found out that Stacy was missing. And then took the call when they announced when they that she her. had been found and that she was dead. And I remember that. I mean, I was... When, when she was taken, I was only a month and seven days away from turning uh, 10 years old. You were just a few months uh, a few months away from turning 12. And you remember Dad? Dad used to tell us, you know, when we would ask him about it, he would tell us. He was like, don't worry about that, you know. And I remember asking Dad, I think all of us asked Dad at one point when, he, when Rhodes was transferred to the Bingham County Jail. Uh, I remember asking Dad about him. And remember he told us that... Rhodes was extremely polite. Yep. He was very polite. He never had to, to, to be asked to do something twice. Uh, it was yes, it was no, it was please and thank you. And he was a very pleasant man. And Dad said he was a completely different man when he was off the meth. Yep. And I remember none of us wanted to believe that because we were all like, no, we were expecting this. Like, well, have you ever seen the picture of the guy? The guy was like 6'3". He was like 230 pounds. Not he 280 had, pounds. Something he like was that. enormous. He, yeah. was a, he was a big guy. He was extremely intimidating, intimidating to look at. I mean, now when I learned of Paul Ezra Rhodes' execution, I had already left the military and was living here in Las Vegas. And while it ended a nearly two and a half decade nightmare, it stirred up a lot of emotions and a lot of feelings that I hadn't felt since I was nine years old. I want to thank Unit 522 for allowing me to use his narration. And if you like what you heard, go check out his channel, Unit 522. And he has a second channel, Uncle Unit. Like and subscribe. I think you'll really enjoy his content. Thank you for joining me and him today on this journey. And remember, it's always about the victims. Until next time. Thank you.